Welcome to Area DMG. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the next of the press conference interviews at NDK 22. And introducing Sandy Fox. <laughs> Um, do you guys know uh, a lot about um, the voice of Chibi Yusa in Sailor Moon and the new Viz dub, uh, the, the regular and also the Crystal, so classic and Crystal. And um, we just actually uh, aired two of the movies in movie theater, so that was pretty exciting, Sailor Moon R and Sailor Moon Super. So, um, And we're still recording, so it's pretty exciting that um, Viz Media has chosen to keep the entire series intact. In the 90s, they did remove some of the content for that wasn't, they felt at that time, socially appropriate for children's audience. But now we have full-blown, you know, relationships, singing Sailor, uh, Neptune, and Uranus, and just all the content is there in the original manga. So it's pretty exciting that we can release this dub and... It's, um, it's it's full expression, and it's also such a beautiful reflection of the world right now. So we're pretty excited about that. But I'll let you guys answer qu or ask questions and let me know what you want to talk about this morning. <laughs> so we'll go through four groups. And then questions after. And then questions after. Same thing. Marcus, from, <clears throat> Marcus from Kaiju no Kami Creativity by Design, LLC. Nice. I'm Bo, and this is JP. We're from Slick Radio. I'm Heather from Nerdfeed. I'm Philip from um, DMGice.com and AreaDMG.com. And I'm Jim, and this is Chris, and we're from The Game Slave. Awesome. So on the note that since you were already talking about Sailor Moon, how did, did you have to find yourself approaching Chibi Usa differently between the classic series and Crystal? I think some of the other characters had more dramatic differences. With my character, there wasn't a lot. Um, of course, Crystal is, is a more dramatic version, it's a more condensed version of the story, more film style, but my character didn't change as much. The tone of my character wasn't, you know, a bit different as like some of the other characters, it was noticeably different. So, no, I didn't have to. There were less campy scenes, you know, those tongue-in-cheek kind of campy humor scenes, but uh, we still had them between me and Usagi, so... Um, I didn't have to change my character that much. Yeah, for um, do you look up like people how review how they review your character, and then do you heavily let that influence how you portray the character? No, actually, I try not to look at reviews. Um, I love being at conventions because you get direct feedback, and I've gotten such amazing supportive feedback on um, my take on Chibiusa and Black Lady, but I, I didn't even look at the original dub. Um, when I auditioned, it was very top secret when they sent out the auditions, and all the Sailor Guardians had already been cast, and I didn't grow up with Sailor Moon. I'm a little bit older than the 90s series, and so I didn't know a whole lot about it, and I didn't research, like I didn't want to watch the 90s dub. I wanted to bring my own essence to the story, and I'm actually on the journey with my character, so I'm not like going far ahead and seeing what happens. Like I'm actually on the journey with her, and that's how I'm choosing to portray the role and experience the, you know, the the story. So um, no, I, I try not to pay attention. You can it can really get you down if <laughs> people are unhappy about your role or. Um, and so I, I just try to do the best job I can um, every time I'm in the studio and honor the story, honor the character, and then, um, you know, really tell that story and breathe life into the character. That's my mission. <laughs> and saving the world one cute voice at a time. <laughs> You're adorable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Alright, uh, you've done a lot of uh, additional characters and shows like King of the Hill and The Simpsons and Futurama. Yeah. Um, out of every like side character that you've done, do you have one that stands out to you that's a favorite for any particular reason? 
Um, no, you know, that's called um, looping or voila or additional dialogue replacement. It was one of my first voiceover jobs in Hollywood. Uh, I moved to LA and got my agent and I was cast in the, the ADR or voila or loop group for The Simpsons. And it was just when The Simpsons in the early 90s were coming off the Tracy Allman show. So there are three women and two men, and we walk into the room every week, and we don't know what the, the, the script is, and they'll just say, okay, all the other main characters have already recorded, you know, Maggie and, you know, Bart and everybody, and so they'll say you're in a schoolhouse, and you have to fill all these kids in the schoolyard, or it's snake whacking day. <laughs> we're we're going to teach you a snake whacking song, <laughs> and you're, you know, for the St. Patrick's episode. So you just, it's, it's, it's truly like 100% improv, and you rely on the sound supervisor to kind of walk you through the script, but um, of what he needs next, and, and that's just how looping works. So not a lot of characters stand out. I did play a Swedish woman drowning in the Simpsons Olympic <laughs> episode. <laughs> hip, hip, I'm drowning, you know, like that's something I, that stood out. And um, I later went on to do two years of The Critic, uh, the same loop group, and then Futurama for two years, and then uh, King of the Hill for seven. And that's such a great show, Mike Judge. Um, that was really a fun show to work on. So, like, so nothing really stands out, but we just have fun every session. It's like playtime. We go in and <laughs> like, okay, what are we doing now? Oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> Has there ever been a particular situation with the loop groups that you've been put in that's just been outrageous and difficult to get into? Uh, nothing difficult to get into, but uh, lots of outrageous things. I mean, I would say most recently, I did the first Wreck-It Ralph loop group, mm -hmm. and when you get called in for a loop group at Disney, it's special, because they bring in the top of the top people. I mean, you're in the room with uh, Jim Cummings, Winnie the Pooh, and Jess Harnell, and you know, Tara Strong, E.G. Daly. Like, they get the best of the best for Disney movies, and um, we came in and they're like, okay, Rich Moore's like, you're going to be, today you're going to be the gummy bears and popcorn and like all these screaming <laughs> candies. And we're like, okay, what does popcorn sound like, you know? Mm -hmm. So we had so much fun with that. And then a challenging session, it was really fun, but it was um, Maleficent for Disney and there were only six of us. So Fred Tadashore, Jessica DeChico, I'm trying to remember who else was in that session, but it was it was a very small, intimate session where we did all the creatures and the little fairies and the, the stick people in the forest. <laughs> and so that that was really cool. But um, that was a lot, you know, a lot of vocal work that day. That was really but it was really it's always such an honor and I'm so grateful to work on a Disney movie. So <laughs> I have a little piece of my heart is in Disney. I worked for Disney for 13 years as an entertainer in the entertainment department in Florida, in the Florida park. So, <laughs> so as a uh, veteran of um, voice acting and acting in general, how do you feel the industry has changed over the years in regards to um, the treatment of employees and how the media itself has evolved? Well, definitely technology has changed everything. Right? I think in so many art forms, we were talking about it in comic books, like now the world's opened up to way more artists, you know, and how we can contact and reach people where you had to go through a certain channel uh, of, you know, getting your demo reel, getting an agent, and actually knocking on doors to get, you know, your, your agent, and you couldn't get a job unless you had an agent. And you had to be in specific cities in the country now. So, you know, social media, technology, and the internet has really opened things up. There are lots of online voiceover agencies. Uh, you can easily send your demo, you know, to anywhere. And so uh, I think we're a lot more accessible, but that's also opened up that world. And I think we're kind of, they call it uh, kind of a Wild West time where digital media is so new as far as what, how are we going to move, you know, transfer out of broadcast television and into this form that's kind of unlimited content. You know, you can watch it over and over again. You can, 
you know, download it. So it's it's like a new, it's like the Wild West. <laughs> so I think we're all trying to figure it out and kind of make our way in it. And and I think that's the the you know my advice is to be open and flexible, and you know kind of go with the flow. And um, you know you have to change your mindset and kind of move into this new age together. What are some pieces of yourself that you see in um, some of the characters that you act, like especially uh, Chibiusa? Oh, there's a lot, yeah. I, I see, you know, um, I came from a childhood where I was uh, on my own a lot. Um, uh, my father uh, had, he struggled with alcoholism, so my mom raised me and I was by myself and so she had to work a lot. So I really resonated with Chibiusa having great responsibility and to her mother and having to come in uh, to from the you know from the past to come back in um, into the or go into yeah go go from the future go into the past and help you know kind of save her mom. <laughs> so but I connect with her sense of like being a little girl with a lot like a mission and responsibility and. Um, uh, emotional, and also I think Chibiusa's superpower is her heart and her empathy and her compassion, and she sees the good in everyone, even those evil characters. You know, she's she's always attracted to them and wants to follow them and help them, and you know, uh, I think that that's her superpower is love, compassion, and empathy, and um, I connect with that a lot. I, I tend to see the good in everyone, and I want to see that and bring that out in people as well. So, for people that might not know what this is, what, what can you tell us about the Love Planet Foundation, and what made you do this? Oh, okay, great. So, you know, my husband is Lex Lang, voice actor Lex Lang. So, 17 years ago, and this is kind of before the Going Green movement and all that was kind of really, really popular. Um, we started the Love Planet Foundation because we said, hey, we're voice actors. How can we use our voice for good? And so we would go into schools and we talk to kids about how to keep your watershed clean, like little tips, you know, um, how they have an impact. Each one of us has an impact on the planet just by our, our daily choices. So um, we were under fiscal sponsorship of Social Environmental Entrepreneurs. It's a big umbrella foundation. Adrian Grenier has his um, foundation to kind of remove plastic straws on the planet, the Lonely Whale Foundation. They house a lot of um, foundations. And it was just in uh, January of this year that we became our own foundation. Uh, under 501c3, you know, recognized by the, um, the government. And so we're, now we're able to do a lot more. So our mission is to produce media, to be at live events and produce live events that inspire youth to, um, you know, take part and uh, participate in being stewards for the planet. And that we're all in this together and just our daily choices can make changes. So education is key. Um, when you know the what's going on in the world and, and your part in it and then how you can change it just by you know one person at a time together a million of us do it we can make positive change so that's what the Love Planet Foundation is um, our goal is to bring more sustainability to comic cons and to use and um, anime cons and to kind of uh, encourage other voices in the industry to do, you know, um, PSAs and kind of inspire youth because, uh, you know, we're influencers and how can we influence the world in a positive way? So, something we're working on. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, oh, I forgot where I was. <laughs> uh, so you had said that you're kind of following the journey with your acting for Sailor Moon. Yes. Do you research any of your other characters prior to the voice work, or do you just kind of go in and just try to fall into the part? Well, you know, anime is so different than mainstream animation. Uh, in anime, of course, you know, the film comes, or the project comes over from Japan. It's translated, then it's adapted that translation, a writer adapts it into the English adaptation that fits in those flaps. The director is a part, you know, he knows everything about that project, he or she, 
And so when you walk into a, an anime, you know, uh, session, you very rarely even know, you know, have much time before you walk into that session to know what show you've been cast in or your role. And then it's like a couple days, you know, oh, we cast you on a Thursday, your first session's on Tuesday, you know, what's your availability the next two weeks? Um, so we completely rely on the director to guide us through the story and the emotional content because we may start on page two and then jump to page 83, you know. So we don't get the full story in front of us or to interact with the other characters like you would in a mainstream animation session. Like I was Harmony and Hi Hi Puffy on Miyumi, and so Gray Delisle, Janice, we were all in the room together and we're reading the script through once and then they record the second and third time and they go back for pickups and we get the script a couple days ahead of time. We know a little bit more about our characters. So if there's time that you could research, but I haven't had that in my history where I had a lot of time to go back and go, you know, find the, the sub, you know, titled version and then watch the whole thing. Um, so most of the time it's, it's a lot of um, surrendering in the room to the project and the director and the script and really trusting those beeps because there's three beeps before you start recording and really trusting. It's really fully surrendering over and trusting and being the instrument, being willing to change on the dime if they want to change the direction or the emotion. I work very intuitively, so I can see in the animation when their eyes start to water up or their expression. Like I tap into the energy of my character on the screen and then I listen to the direction and try to go with the direction. My next question is actually kind of related to that. Um, since you've done anime and you've done cartoons, um, do you have a preference for voicing characters in one department over the other for any particular reason? Well, the great thing about um, mainstream animation is that there's a lot more room for improv, like in, you know, in Puffy Amiyumi, you know, I would add this creepy little stalker giggle. <laughs> and so the animators can write that in, you know, or kind of, they, they kind of work, they animate to your voice. Where anime um, is much more technical because there's so many things happening in the room at the time you're recording, you're looking at your script, you know, the director's directing you, and you have, you're like acting in a time slot. And you have to get that emotion out in like a time you know, piece, where as in mainstream animation there's a little more room. I can't say that, you know, I love all of it. I feel so grateful to be able to, to, to express my creativity and, and get to use my voice and my gifts and talents, you know, so I love all of it. You, you know, you're always happy when you get a call. <laughs> Come on, you're doing this, wow, okay, you know, because we audition a lot. All of us audition a lot. Um, and, and then you know, they say it's like one out of 50, uh, so you just never know, but then um, those numbers got, get bigger once you have the world's opened up a lot more, you know, more people, you know, are auditioning. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you mentioned about empathy or energy, one thing you may have noticed um, since you've been here at NDK, we have this wonderfully vibrant energy around us, this beautiful positivity of that. So, I have a quick question, um, really. Um, one thing about these conventions, and you'll have you may have noticed, is that everyone is kind of like flowing in that energy. They, they bring in that positive energy, but like, they have that little, bit of a, that little bit of a high, that convention high. Mm -hmm. But when the um, convention's over and people go back to their daily lives and their work or school or family life, Sometimes they lose that energy, that positivity. Do you have any suggestions for how they can ground that energy or keep that energy going um, in their day-to-day -day lives outside of the convention? Well, I definitely love that you mentioned that. Um, it kind of ties into why I'm so honored to be working on Sailor Moon. There's something about this world where everyone's accepted. You know, there's, there's no judgment, you know, it's like every color, every race, every size, every shape, you know, and, you know, every community, everyone's so accepted here, and I, you know, part of our work in the Love Planet Foundation is how can we bring this energy out into the world? 
you know. Um, so, but I would say it's really easy to get caught up in negativity, especially on social media and with our political, you know, system at this time. It's kind of like negativity is popular, you know, to like chime in and that'll just bring you down right away. So I, you know, if people can stay in the flow of like posting positive things about their life and, you know, really just staying in that field of, you know, what's good today? I know all these things aren't so great, and, but what, focus on what's good because uh, there's a thing called the law of attraction and where we place our attention becomes our intention. And so, and that's just brings more of that into our world. So when we focus on the good, more good comes. And it's really all existing in the world. You know, there's good, there's bad, and it's like where, what, what pool do I want to put my energy into today? Do I want to feed the good, or if I feed the bad, then there's just going to be more that shows up in my life. You know? So yeah, I would just say stay focused on what's good in your life. What are you grateful for? That's a good question. I try to wake up with that every day, like, what are three things I'm grateful for? And uh, go from there, start my day from there. <laughs> Thank you, though. That's a great question. Do you have a piece of media or another actor that's really influenced your work and how you um, approach acting? Oh, well, <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> I started um, professionally performing when I was 14 and 15. Um, I did musical theater in high school, and then I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I worked at a theme park, um, Kennywood Theme Park in Pittsburgh. I was an entertainer, and um, when I was 17, I moved to Orlando and started performing for Disney World. But, you know, my influences were comedy-based, like Carol Burnett. You know, these are, these are some of the old days, but I love, love, love Carol Burnett and all the variety shows. And, but I would have to say she's one of my, my biggest influences as far as, like, just acting and comedy and bringing joy. I love the Muppets growing up. Oh my gosh, I love, love, love the Muppets. And I actually got an opportunity in the 90s to be on uh, Muppets Tonight. It was the Don Rickles episode. <laughs> and um, I was one of Grouper's cheerleaders and we were trying to take over the, the TV station and I slapped uh, Kermit with a, a powder puff. <laughs> and uh, Grouper says, it's a hostile takeover, not a makeover. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was fun. Yeah, but those are my influences. Disney, all the Disney movies um, growing up, and, and the Muppets, like everything magical. I was just a fan of joy and magic. So that's all the time we have. There's any um, last statements you want, you want to be able to give our press outlets before we... Oh, okay. Your social media. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. social media uh, on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Sandy Fox World, Facebook Sandy Fox, and uh, my website sandyfox.com, and uh, Love Planet Foundation. Just just Google it. So thanks, you guys. Mwah. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Maya.